Hi y'all, welcome back to another round of physics. And uh, yeah, today uh, we'll discuss a couple of, of concepts. So we'll put Ampere's law. Okay, and I believe there's an accent aigu here. I'll have to double check that. So let me write down Ampere's law first and then we'll get a, an idea about what's going on here. So this deals with the magnetic field. So I'll put B and I'll put dot DL here equals mu naught I enclosed. And I'll go ahead again and I'm gonna put that little circle in. Okay. So first of all, notice you have a closed shape again. Now, when we are dealing with Gauss's law for the electric field, the shape, the closed shape, had to have some sort of closed area. Or a different way to say it is that it had to confine, it had to define a boundary of a volume. And I said wrapping paper. Imagine taking wrapping paper. and When you wrap something, you're essentially putting wrapping paper around the surface area, and that surface area defines the volume inside. Here, we are going to do a wrapping again. You notice we have a closed integral, so we have to have a shape that is complete. But rather, it is not a 2D surface that defines the boundary of a three-dimensional volume. For Ampere's law, it is a 1D surface enclosing a 2D volume. So what does this look like? Okay, we can draw any 1D line that we want. We just have to make sure that at the end of the day, it is complete, it is fully closed. In other words, the edges of that line match up. That's what the circle means here. It has, that's a reminder that whatever line that we choose, we better make sure that it's complete, that the endpoints match back up. Now, that's, that's what the DL is. And you'll notice that we have to do a dot product with the magnetic field. So what does this mean? We first of all, we have to define our 1D line and notice it encloses a area. And the second thing that we have to choose is we have to choose the direction of DL. Generally, if you know which direction the magnetic field is, pick DL to be parallel to the magnetic field. That just makes life easier. When DL is parallel to the magnetic field, your dot product gives you positive number. Again, it doesn't matter if you happen to choose the other way, then you just get a negative number at the end of the day. Okay. So that's what this left side does. Now it's kind of weird, it's miraculous really, is that if you can see, so let's say for a second, I've given you DL in red, and let's say that the magnetic field happens, I'll do that in green, okay? Maybe it's really big right here, maybe it's really small right here, maybe it's really big right there, okay? So if you look at every single point along this loop and look at the overlap, okay, right? That's what the dot product gives us is the overlap between the two vectors. So as you go around this loop, you're looking at the overlap of the magnetic field with the little segments of the line all the way around. And it's, that's the weird thing. It's kind of miraculous, like I said, is that if you take that entire summation, it tells you something about the current inside the loop, enclosed. So let's get an idea about how, how to use this. Now, truth be told, just like the Gauss's law for the electric field, okay, I said Gauss's law for the electric field is always true. Okay. It's true. In fact, if you want, okay, you, can, you can do one of two things. You can say that Coulomb's law is correct and actually derive Gauss's law. You can also say Gauss's law is correct and go ahead and derive Coulomb's law. Okay. So Gauss's law is always true, just not always useful. Gauss's law is the most useful when symmetry exists. If you can find some symmetry in the problem, Gauss's law becomes very useful. And the same thing it can be said about 
Ampere's law. Ampere's law is always true. It's just not always useful. If you can find some sort of symmetric situation, then Ampere's law will make life easy. In fact, we've already done, we did one. Right now, we did one last video for the infinite wire. Imagine for a moment, we can actually get the magnetic field for an infinite wire using Ampere's law. And it's actually, in my mind, fairly, fairly fast. What we'll do, let's say for a moment, we have a line charge and I'm going to surround that line charge with my loop, my DL. Now let's use the right hand rule shortcut, thumb in the direction of the current, fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field. And so I'm going to run my DL going this way, parallel to the magnetic field. Well, let's go ahead and apply Ampere's law to find the magnetic field due to an infinite current carrying wire. Go ahead and pause the video. Okay, you got it? Good. Now I centered it. I centered our loop right on the wire. I'll go ahead and call the radius of my orange loop. I'll call that little r. And that means that my little arc length along that circle can be expressed as r d theta. And now I'm saying theta is the angle in the uh, yz plane. So I'll call that theta. Now our magnetic field, we don't know what the strength is, but by our right hand rule, we at least know that it's parallel to dl. And so that means I can get rid of the dot product. I can just set this. You could, I guess, put the cosine of the angle between the two. But because we chose dl to be parallel to b, we can put zero in right here. Don't forget, we still have to do that integration. And again, because I put the loop centered exactly on the current, what can you tell me about the magnitude of the magnetic field? It's constant. At any point along that loop, it should be constant. So I can pull that outside the integral. And I have something that says b, the integral of r d theta. Oh, wait about r. r is also a constant. So I can pull that out and get mu naught i enclosed. Well, let's go ahead. The integral of d theta, and to make sure it's a closed loop, I have to go from 0 to 2 pi. That ensures that I have a full loop. And so I end up with something that says 2 pi r, the magnitude of b, equals mu naught i enclosed. And then all I do is let's move that to the other side. So I get the magnitude of b is equal to mu naught i enclosed over 2 pi r. Now, if you go back and check our previous video, this is indeed what we got by integrating the law of bios of r from negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay, this is the same result as we got by taking bios of r, dl cross r hat, r squared, and we have an i in there, and we integrated dl from negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay. That is the exact same expression. So Gauss's law, or excuse me, Ampere's law can help us get to that result in a faster manner. Pretty cool, huh? Let me give you a couple of other situations.
So one situation that generally arises that Ampere's law is helpful is what's called the solenoid. So a solenoid. And in particular, finding the magnetic field within a solenoid. So let me give you some basic setup and then we'll, we'll talk about you know, going through and figuring this out. But imagine a loop for a second, a loop of current. And what I'll do is I'll say, okay, well, pretend it's coming out in, into the page. And so I'll have something like this. Okay. So again, you can pretend that it's coming out of the page and looping around and going in. Yeah. And the question is, let's say for a moment that the radius or the diameter of the loop, whichever you prefer, I guess I'll call this 2R, assume, let's say for a moment, that the distance to my field point is much larger than the diameter of the loop. Okay. So something like, okay, we'll call this distance. And if distance is much, much larger than the diameter of the loop, what can we say about the magnetic field, the net magnetic field at this field point? Well, if we use our right-hand rule shortcut, the magnetic field due to the portion of the current coming out of the board, well, that will be to the right. So I'll say this is B from the top part. And the magnetic field due to the bottom part will be to the left. Call this bottom. Now, here's the, here's the point, is that if my distance to the field point is much, much larger than, if you will, the separation distance between these top and bottom pieces, what can you tell me about the magnitude of these two contributions, roughly speaking. They're roughly the same magnitude, which means that if they're roughly the same magnitude in their opposite directions, okay, that means that the net magnetic field outside, away, far away from this loop, the net magnetic field is approximately zero. So that's kind of the first piece. Now, let's say for a moment that we take a bunch of these loops and we string them together. In other words, you can say, okay, I've got a series of wires where the current is coming out and a series, you know, there are a bunch of loops stacked on top of each other. And so you can think of the bottom segment, the current going into the board. Now, the, of course, outside, out here, for example, we'll say that the magnetic field is approximately zero. Anywhere outside of the loops, B field is approximately equal to zero. The next thing that we have to look at is what happens inside the loops. Okay, what can we say about the magnetic field inside the loops? Well, again, let's say for a moment, let's look at the magnetic field due to this one top loop right here, this, this one piece right here. Okay. And the magnetic field there is going to be, again, using our right-hand rule shortcut, it's going to be to the right. Call that the top one. How about this one? How about this piece? Now, if we use our right-hand rule again, you'll see that in this instance, inside, the magnetic field, say bottom, they're also going to be to the right. So inside the loop, the two fields combine, they add up. Instead of canceling each other outside of the loop, they add together inside. Okay. Now it just so turned, it just so happens, this is. Yeah. Now you could say, well, what about, what about, for example, let's put an axis in here so we're a little bit more clear on what we're talking about. We'll say X and Y and Z will be out of the board. Yeah. You say, well, wait a minute, Greg. What about, I mean, 
say if you're off center, say if your field point's right here, okay, won't your B fields have some sort of Y component to them? And I would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's say for a second, let's look at two adjacent wires where the current is going in. And you can think of, oh, excuse me, I've got the wrong color. The B field for this right one, say you're looking at a field point right here. You have a B field due to the right wire kind of going upwards like that. But the B field due to the left wire is going to be kind of like in that 4 o'clock position. So you might have one going at the 2 o'clock position and another one at the maybe 5 o'clock position. And what do you notice is that if I take those contributions and add them together, I get roughly horizontal. Okay. And you could say the same thing if you do the top ones, say at a point that's kind of halfway between. Okay, well, the magnetic field due to the left one is going to be something like this way. The magnetic field due to the right one is going to be some way that way. And so your net field, again, will basically be in the horizontal direction. So, and we've seen this situation before. And this seems somewhat some. This is the analogous situation. In the electric field case, how we got this was what we called a capacitor, right? If we charge up two parallel plates, you end up with some positive charge on the upper plate, some negative charge on the lower plate, for example, and the electric field in between the two plates, net, is roughly constant. Incidentally, the electric field outside the two plates is approximately zero. And that was our introduction to capacitors. The solenoid is the magnetic equivalent to a, a capacitor. So a solenoid, you can think of it as being a series of loops now, in, in practicality, it's actually a coil, right? A coil of wire. But what you can think of instead is a series of loops where the loops are stacked one on top of the other. So if we take that and we cutaway view it, generally what you see is, okay, so pretend that these are subsequent loops. You have, I think I've been calling the current coming out of the board here. And then on the bottom, you have them going into the board. And I said that this is the magnetic equivalent to a parallel plate capacitor. What do I mean by that? Is that inside the solenoid, the magnetic field is roughly constant. B net, I'll say constant. NST, with inside. Outside, the magnetic field is approximately zero. The solenoid is a way of storing energy in the magnetic field, just like how the capacitor was a way of storing energy in the electric field. Now the capacitor, we said, uh, let's see, the electric field, the magnitude of the electric field inside the capacitor something like sigma over epsilon naught. And we showed that using Gauss's law for the electric field. We will now apply Ampere's law to get an idea about the magnitude of the magnetic field inside the solenoid. And please remember, just like Gauss, just like the parallel plate capacitors, we ignore the fringe field. Fringe field. In other words, when we are dealing with the parallel plate capacitor, we assume that the area of the plates was much, much larger than the separation distance. 
what that allows us to do is pretend that this parallel plate is infinitely long, and so we can ignore these fringe effects. We will do the same thing with the solenoid. We will assume that the length of the solenoid is much greater than the radius of the solenoid. What that allows us to do is basically ignore what happens at the edges. Okay. So let's go ahead. Let's now get an idea about applying Ampere's law. So let's say that we are running a current I in this coil of wire, in the solenoid itself. Okay. And without loss of generality, I'll say that it's flowing out the top and it's going back into the board on the bottom side. We'll go ahead and we'll call this the X direction. I guess for completeness, I'll call that Y and Z is out of the board. So now let's go ahead and we want to apply Ampere's law. And I will go ahead, we are free to choose whatever loop we want. I am going to choose this loop. So I've just kind of dash lined it. And I should ask ourselves, how many different pieces do I need to break this loop up into? We say four. Okay. Just like when we were applying Gauss's law for the electric field and we had to look at the number of n hats. Remember, for each n hat that we had for our volume, that's a different integral that we need to do. Okay. So if you do a cylinder, you have three n hats, one for the top face, one for the bottom face, and one for the side. Okay. The same thing, we have to apply the same idea here. How many different DLs do we have? Is there a convenient way of writing DL in terms of our coordinate system. Well, yeah, it's convenient to call each side a separate DL, and then we have four paths that we need to integrate over. So let's see here, what direction do we want DL to be in? And I would say I would encourage you, let's put DL in the same direction as the magnetic field. If given this choice, that's a nice, convenient way of doing it. Okay. Now, we know that the magnetic field inside the solenoid, using our shortcut right-hand rule, okay. Uh, oh, okay, I see, I swapped it, okay. Life goes on. Inside, using our shortcut, you can think of the top is going into the board, and so we curl our hand around and so we know that the magnetic field inside the solenoid is going this way, B net. Right, if I take my thumb and point it into the board, the magnetic field due to this is going that way. Same thing if I take this one and I point my thumb out of the board, I get an idea that the magnetic field generated by that wire is this way. So inside, between the, inside the loop, the magnetic field is to the left. So let's go ahead and choose DL inside the loop to be going to the left, which means that as I go around, excuse me, this one's messy, as I go around, so now I've marked DL for each of the four sides of my loop. So let's go ahead now and evaluate the left-hand part of this equation. And we have four loops that we have to worry about. Okay, or excuse me, I should say four segments. We have the right segment, we have the left segment, we have the top segment, and we have the bottom segment. And I'll put mu naught i enclosed here. First question, what's the magnetic field outside of the loop, approximately speaking? Zero. Okay. So if I take this top integral for a second, if I'm looking at this top one, I have to take the magnetic field outside of the coil and I dot it into a length vector d 
DL here, and DL is in the X direction. So I need to do DX 1, 0, 0. But, so I, I mean, you can think of DL or DX if you prefer. I guess DX would be a better way of saying it. 1, 0, 0. But the magnetic field outside is 0. So 0 dotted into whatever vector, this is just going to give me 0. I'll say because B out equals 0. There is no magnetic field outside the loop, outside, outside of this solenoid. Well, how about the left and the right pieces? What can you tell me about the magnetic field integrated along this route as opposed to the magnetic field integrated along this route? And remember, we're using symmetry here. So what we can say, if I'm looking at this right-hand piece for a second, notice, so if I make a field point, let's make a field point, that's a good idea. Say I make a field point right here, notice that the contribution to the top wires would give me a magnetic field going up. But the contribution to the bottom wires, it's going to give me a magnetic field going down. And so the same idea is that on the right and left hand sides, the magnetic field is approximately zero. So when I integrate around this loop, my left side is zero, my right side is zero, my top is zero. And so what I get is basically the integral of, I'll call it the inside magnetic field, dotted into DL. That is going to be mu naught times I enclosed. So we've, we've turned having to do four integrals into one, okay, arguing that, hey, we don't have to worry about outside, top, left, or right. There we go. Got it. So now we, the last thing is, well, we keep going, but we set up, we purposely chose the direction of DL to be in the same direction as the magnetic field, which means the angle between those two vectors is zero. And so we can simply rewrite this now as the magnitude inside times, and I'll say DX here, right? DL is in the direction of the X vector. Notice, Technically, it's, neg it's uh, dl is equal to negative dx, I guess 1, 0, 1, excuse me, 1, 0, 0. I'll put the negative sign inside. But the magnetic field is also in the negative x direction. Call this bn, comma, 0, comma, 0. So when I do the dot product, that's why I get bn dx. And I still have mu naught. I enclosed here. Well, this is just a constant, so I can pull that out. And I'll integrate my x from 0 to l, okay, where l represents the length of the solenoid. Well, let's work on this left side now. Do you notice, let's say that I have capital N loops making up my solenoid. What's the enclosed current? Well, if, if my solenoid is carrying a current I, that means that a current I is running through each of my loops. And I said that I have N number of loops and so my I enclosed would be N times I. So we go ahead. This is B in times L mu naught N I. Or we get the final answer. The magnetic field, the strength of the magnetic field inside the solenoid is given by mu naught N I 
over L. Now, sometimes, so if you know the number of turns in your solenoid, your coil of wire, then this would be the way to go. Okay. Sometimes, and often this is the case, is that rather than knowing the actual number of turns, big N, and the length of the solenoid, sometimes you're given little n, which is called the turn density. Or in other words, the number of turns per unit length. So rather than seeing this big N over L, you will often see it as the magnetic field. And now instead of saying inside, I'll just put solenoid here. Solenoid is equal to mu naught little n times i. And again, this represents the turn density. If you have more turns per unit length, the magnetic field inside the solenoid is going to be stronger. Less and less turns. Now, like I said, this is how you can store energy in the magnetic field. It is the analog to the parallel plate capacitor. When we see this in circuits, we generally do not use the term solenoid. We will use the term inductor. We have to, we'll get further there. Okay. We still need to go through Faraday's law and understand Faraday's law. Let me give you the other example that I can think of for an application of Ampere's law. Okay. This one's called the toroid. And I know I've mentioned it when I was just talking about magnetic confinement. Tor tori torid. Torid. I can't remember if it's a double R or a single R. If you prefer, it's the donut shape. Okay. So imagine for a moment, we have a loop of wire, just like a solenoid, but what we do is that we loop it around. So you take that solenoid, that loop of wire, and then imagine that you take that loop and wrap it around so that it reconnects. So it forms that a donut-like shape. So you end up with a donut, if you will, where the wire, just loops all the way around, keeps looping, keeps looping, okay? Sorry, I know that's a terrible picture. And let's say for a moment that we run current in that wire. So we'll run it, we'll run it from the inside outwards. So it loops back around, comes up and goes, okay? And the question is, what's the magnetic field inside? Maybe I'll say the magnitude of the magnetic field. Well, we can choose an Amperian loop inside. Sorry, I keep hitting the eraser there. Let's choose an Amperian loop that runs around inside the toroid. Go ahead. Take a shot at it. You got it? Okay, well, let's go at it. Now here, let's use our right hand rule again. We want to figure out what is the direction of the magnetic field inside the toroid, and then we'll choose DL to go in the same direction. So let's see, if it's going outwards, so imagine taking your thumb and grabbing that wire, and then curling your fingers until you're inside the toroid. And how I have it drawn with the current going outwards, the magnetic field will be circulating in this direction. I've done that in green. Which means taking DL, I'm going to run it so that it goes, if you will, counterclockwise when viewed from above. Okay. 
If I take DL to go counterclockwise when viewed from above, that means that it will be parallel. That choice will make sure that DL is parallel to my magnetic field. And if DL is parallel to my magnetic field, I can now write my dot product. I'll just say the magnitude of the magnetic field times the magnitude of my DL. Of course, on the other hand, we still have mu naught I enclosed. Now, a second question for you. How many pieces do I need to break this integral up into? Say one. Okay. Right now, we have a circular shape. Okay. Cartesian is not usually the best way to do it. Polar is the best way to do it. Okay. So a small little arc length is represented by DL. I should rename that. Re I mean, if I, if I want to express this in terms of a radius and an angle, I better do R D theta. That will represent a small arc length along this purple circle. And if I, what are my limits of integration now? Zero to two pi. Good, good, good. So now I don't have, I can only, I can do this in one integral from zero to two pi. B is a constant, right? We're still inside a coil of wire. So B should be roughly constant. And what do I get for, I say B for a given distance. Okay, so say R is fixed. So I'll put R here. And then I get 2 pi d theta. That is equal to mu naught i enclosed. Okay. So again, we play our same song and dance. We get on the right hand, left hand side, we get 2 pi r times the magnitude of b. On the right hand side, we say mu naught. And if we know that each loop is carrying a current i, we can express this as the number of turns in the toroid times i, the current being carried by each of those turns. And so we get that the magnetic field inside the toroid is given by mu naught n i over 2 pi r. Right? Pretty cool, huh? Keep in mind, notice that unlike the solenoid, right, when we had just this long, you know, whatchamadubobber, inside the toroid, as you move further and further from that central axis, the center of the toroid, your magnetic field will decrease ever so slightly. Okay. This is actually why if you look back at that picture of the tokamak, boom, Okay. You'll notice that the tokamak isn't, doesn't actually have a circular cross section. If you're able to take that, you notice at that picture, this, the cross section is not circular. This is the reason, that R. Okay? If it's perfectly circular, then as you get further away from that central axis, the magnetic field strength gets weaker. Okay. So actually, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the tokamak, the cross section is more like a D, if you will, almost more like D-shaped. And the reason for that is that a tokamak wants to try to keep the magnetic field constant through the entire cross section. That makes it easier to control the plasma. And because of that, they have to shape the cross section a little bit more funky. So that's just uh, more basic knowledge, but um, you can impress your friends with that. Okay. So there we are, that is the general magnetic field inside a toroid. And again, based on Ampere's law. Those are about the three situations that I can think of, okay? An infinite wire, a solenoid, and a toroid. Toroid, there we go. It's a double, excuse me, it's a double R, and I drop the O, there we go. That looks better. Those are the three instances where Ampere's law is really, really helpful. And again, it's because of the symmetry of the situation, infinite number of loops, or you notice a circular shape that's symmetric. Okay. Those are the three places where Ampere's law really comes in handy. Make sure you know those.
Okay. This one in particular, the solenoid, as I hinted at, will be the basis of the inductor. So you definitely need to remember that one. Okay. Hey, I think that's it for right now. Thanks for your attention. I'll see you next time.